Welcome to Yahweh's Assembly and Messiah in Rocheport, Missouri. If you'll all rise, I'll offer an opening prayer. Most gracious, eternal, heavenly Father Yahweh, this body of believers is gathered in your name. We're so thankful for the Sabbath day, the day that you've set apart to uh, have this day of appointment where we can come and be in your presence and uh, make our requests known and and to praise you and to bask in the Holy Spirit and let it pour over us, Father Yahweh. We thank you for all the blessings of this day before they're even bestowed upon us. Father, we uh, just ask that you take charge of this service now. I'm only a person standing here, but uh, we know that uh, this is your service, and uh, we give it all to you. I give all you the, the, the all the honor and the praise and the glory. And Father, we thank you for the brethren that have uh, gathered here in this room, and we just ask that everyone be edified by the messages that are brought and the music that we share. And, and Father, we, uh, we just thank you and praise you for this honor and privilege to come before you this way. And we give you all the praise in the, the name of our blessed kinsman redeemer, Yahshua, our Savior, our King. Amen and hallelujah. Today's date, the biblical date, is the 11th day of the 12th month. 12th month. Man, Passover's coming up quick, isn't it? Hallelujah. On man's calendar, the Gregorian calendar, it would be March the 4th, 2023. And our scripture to lead us off here to begin with is Psalms 27, verses 6 through 9. Of Paraphrased a little bit, I imagine. I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Yes, I will sing praises unto Yahweh. Hear, O Yahweh, when I cry, O Elohim of my salvation. Hallelujah.
Precious and eternal Father, Yah. once again we're gathering in your great and set-apart name through our high priest, Yahshua Messiah. Father, we lift up these prayers on behalf of those who are sick and have physical ailments and other type of ailments going on right now. All those that the uh, elder mentioned, the brothers, sisters, whoever that's going through this at this time, Father, we just ask that according to your word, it's going to be. It says it in several places of your word, in the Torah, in the prophets. Father, we know that you are healing. We know that you can do it instantly, gradually, miraculously. In every way that you see fit, it's going to happen. Father, we walk by faith and not by sight. We know that when you say something, we can assure, have the full assurance of faith that it's going to happen, just like you say it is. And we ask that you move on behalf of our brothers and sisters and those who are suffering right now from ailments in the physical. That 1 Peter 2.24 and Isaiah 53.5, Father. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement for our shalom was upon him. And with his stripes and by his stripes, you said that we're healed. That's past tense, that's present tense, that's eternal tense. And we ask that you move through the power of your Ruach, HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will be in these places where our brothers and sisters are suffering and going through these things. And we're counting it done right now, this very second, in Yahshua's great and set-apart name. Hallelujah. If you'll all stand, I'll read uh, Genesis chapter 36. Uh I'm glad I don't have to expound on this one because it's all about Esau. But uh, it's important history, things we need to know. And I'm going to be reading this from uh, Elder A.B. Trana's Bible. Uh, the Scripture Research Association. Genesis 36. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebaioth. And Ada bare unto Esau Elasphas, and Bashamath bare Ruel, and Aholibama bare Jesh, Jeush, and Jealam, and Korath. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan, and went unto the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Bashamath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, and Zeho, and Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's sons. And she bare unto Eliphaz Amalek. And these were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. 
And these are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, and Zerah, and Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Bashmath, Esau's wife. And these were the sons of Aholibamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. And she bare unto Esau, Jehush, and Jalem, and Korah. These were the dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Timon, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kinaz, Duke Korah, Duke Getam, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. And these are the sons of Reuel, Esau's sons, Duke Nahath, Duke Zerah, Duke Shammah, Duke Mizah. These are the dukes that came of Reuel in the land of Edom. And these are the sons of Bashmath, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife, Duke Jehush, Duke Jalam, Duke Korah. These are the dukes that came of Aholibama the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and, and these are their dukes. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land of Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, and Ana, And Dishan and Ezer, and Dishan, these are the dukes of the Horites, of the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Horai, and Heman, and, Lo and Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobal, these were these, Alvan, Manathath, and Ibal, and Shifo, and Onam. These are the children of Zibion, both Aya and Ana. This is that Ana that was found in the hot springs in the wilderness. As he fled, as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. And the children of Ana were these Dishan and Holibama, and the daughter of Ana, and these are the children of Dishan, Hebda and Eshban, and Ithran and Haran. The children of Ezer are these Bilhan and Zaphon and Achan. The children of Dishan are these, Uz and Aran. These are the dukes that came of the Horites, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Anna. Duke Dishan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishan, these are the dukes that came of Horai, among their dukes in the land of Seir. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom, before they, there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dianahaba. And Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah, of, Borah, of Bozra, died in his stead. Reigned in his stead, I'm sorry. Let me read that verse again. And Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah, of Bozra, reigned in his stead. And Jobab died, and Husham, in the land of Timnai, reigned in his stead. And Husham died, and Hadad the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Avith. And Hadad died, and Samla of Mashrika reigned in his stead. And Samla died, and Shaul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. And Shaul died, and Baalhana, the son of Achbor, reigned in his stead. And Baalhana, the son of Achbor, died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Methhabil, the daughter of Hatred, the daughter of Mez Mezahab. These are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families after their places by their names Duke Timnah, Duke Alva, Duke Jetheth, Duke Aholibama, Duke Elah, Duke Pinon, 
Duke Kenaz, Duke Tima, and Duke Mizba, Mibzar, Duke Magdiel, Duke Imram. These be the dukes of Edom, according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Hallelujah. All right, at this time, we'll have our first message by Elder Mike Wardlow. All right, praise Yah. Hallelujah. It's a blessing uh, to be here and uh, to see all my sisters and brothers in the faith. And uh, we've, we've, we've missed you. And uh, that's what families do. We missed you. So praise Yah. Uh, today, um, this is a, a similar study that I gave uh, over a year ago. And uh, I was watching a program called uh, Just a Word. And it was able to give me a little bit more insight on this subject. This subject is very important. Um, the title of it is Weeping and Gnashing of Teeth. Um, it's about a little known sin that I think that is going to prevent many from entering into the kingdom of Yah. Um, and that bothers me. Every time I hear this, uh, well, let's go to uh, Luke chapter 13. I think it should bother many of us when we when we read something like this in the scriptures because every time I read it it shocks me. And it's Luke chapter 13 verses 26. And I'll read it says uh then shall ye begin to say we have eaten and drunk in thy presence and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of Elohim, and you yourselves thrust out. This bothers me because to me, he is not speaking to people that's just dead set on going to hell. To me, I get that he's speaking to somebody that at least appear to think that they're on the road to righteousness. That could be you, that could be me. We're on that road. We're on the road. And to get a devastating news to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom and we ourselves thrust out, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will. There's another scripture that bothers me. Matthew chapter 7. 22, verse 23. It starts right off from the very get-go to let you know that something's amiss. Because it says, many, many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you? Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Depart from me. Again, to me, it appears that he's speaking to people that believe that they're on the road to righteousness. They're on that road to the kingdom. And this, too, is another sad thing. But I want to share something right here. It says, depart from me, you that work iniquity. See, there's a difference between sin and iniquity. Sin is an immoral 
act against the laws of Yah. It's an act that you repent of and you turn away from it. But iniquity is an immoral, unjust, unfair behavior. That means that apparently you have gotten so comfortable in this particular sin that you don't even see it as sin. You don't even see it as sin anymore. You've gotten so comfortable with this thing. Can anybody imagine that? I mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, I don't, I, li I don't like telling these kind of stories. I know it embarrasses my wife, but you can convince yourself that a lot of things are not sin. I convinced myself for years that I wasn't a thief. Anything I could fit in my hand, I said, well, you know, if I can fit it in my hand, that's not stealing. That's a pill for her. Is that crazy? My wife would be at the store and I said, give me that lipstick. And she said, what are you doing? I said, never mind. And I walk out the store with it until she ran up behind me and act like a cop. And that scared the holy. It, it, it scared me. And I said, I'll never do that again. But for years. And I'm just, I'm just, you know, this is serious. But I convinced myself that's not a thief. I'm, I'm a, I'm a pilferer. Anyway, isn't that crazy? But you can convince yourself of almost anything if you choose to believe that. Imagine that. I'm gonna get knocked out of the kingdom because I stole a tube of lipstick. Isn't that crazy? All right, hallelujah. Don't y'all tell nobody that story. Because this was years ago. <laughs> Before I even knew Abba Yah. This was years ago. All right. So praise Yahweh. So I want you to understand this iniquity thing here. Could it be that these individuals were stuck in the sin and they did not know or was not aware that they were actually sinning? There could be a point there. Uh, Brother Israel brought up another interesting point this morning when we were discussing that. I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's too long of a day it would be too long but listen here saints we must take entering the kingdom seriously and start looking for the roadblocks that will prevent us from entering into the kingdom and then repent and repent because there obviously is some roadblocks out there that people are not aware of that's going to prevent you or you're going to hear those awful words depart from me I never knew you you're going to say what Listen, let's take a clear picture of some of these roadblocks that are standing in a lot of people's way from entering into this kingdom. And we're going to start at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look at this thing here and we're going to examine these roadblocks that they said, if you do these things, you will not enter the kingdom of Yah. That's, I want to know what those are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of Yah. So we know that if we're unrighteous, we're not getting in. We also are told here, Be not deceived, neither fornicators. So we understand that fornicators won't be in, in the kingdom. Don't, be, don't deceive yourself. We also understand that idolaters, nor, nor uh, 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 adulterers. You won't get into the kingdom. Don't deceive yourself. Nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Don't deceive yourselves. You will not get into the kingdom. And if that is part of your character, repent. Or you hear those words, depart from me. I don't know you. Verse 10, nor thieves, I see, I, you couldn't get into the kingdom. It's not happening. Nor covetous or drunkards or revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of Yah. Now I'm going to ask you, which one of those are you having trouble with? Anybody care to raise their hand on fornication? 
being an adulterer, being a thief, being overly covetous. Okay. All right. We got any extortioners in here? Anybody want to raise a hand? <laughs> All right. Do we have any revilers in here? Anybody in here? We have any revilers in here? Anybody want to raise their hand to that one? I got mine halfway up. Huh? The definition for reviler is one who criticizes in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. Yes, come on. You see, see, the truth is, that's the truth. I should have seen every hand in here raise up. I really should have. If you're honest with yourself, if you're somebody that criticized somebody to the point where you're to the anger and you're being abusive in your criticism of a person, that's you. You're a reviler. Own it. And save your souls. That's why I believe many of us will miss that mark. Because we criticize people at the drop of a dime. Let somebody say something crazy to me, I'm going to revile them back. That's what we do. That's what we do. If we're honest with ourselves. If you can't be honest here, you sure won't be honest trying to get into the kingdom. You're going to get knocked down. Hallelujah. I'm a reviler. I repent because I don't want nobody to cause me to miss the mark. Because revilers will not get into the kingdom. And the next time you choose to criticize somebody in a hurtful and angrily manner, just think about your father telling you, get out of here. You don't belong in my kingdom. That's not the character he's looking for. And that's not the character that we should be exhibiting if we truly are on the vine of our Messiah. Because he doesn't have that kind of fruit on his vine. So I have to ask myself, where did I get that fruit from? Where did I get that fruit from? Hmm? Since I'm the only reviler in here, <laughs> I'm going to take this whooping. I'm going to take this whooping, and I pray that somebody learns something from my spanking. Hallelujah. Listen. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. Listen what it says. It says, even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. This is what we supposed to look like being reviled. We bless being persecuted. We suffer it. Ooh, we this is first century saints because we today don't act like this. When somebody revile us, what do we do? We double down. We come back hard. And that's not what we're supposed to do. That's not what we're supposed to do. John 15, 4, listen to this. This is your Messiah. He says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. 
No more can ye except ye abide in me. He says you don't have the ability, if you're on my vine, to go out and bear different fruit. If we're true to the Messiah, we should not have that fruit. To criticize somebody to the point where you put them down to make them feel less than yourself. Make your, you exalt yourself and let somebody feel like they're an ant in your presence. That's not the character of Yah. No. And it's not the character of his people. Hallelujah. I'm just saying because I had to realize and understand that when I actually saw myself in here as a reviler. Oh, my God. Listen here. John, 1 John 2, 6 says, He that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk as the Messiah. That's right. We ought to walk as the Messiah. We ought to walk just a, first. I'm, you know what? Back up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, because it tells us how we should look first. We should look like our Messiah. And 1 Peter 2, verse 23 says, Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. What did he do when somebody reviled our Messiah? He committed himself unto Yah. He gave it to Yah and said, Yah, you deal with this. I'm going to keep walking. I'm not going to turn around and bust them upside the head. I'm not going to turn around and put something on the Internet and revile this person. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give it to Yah, and I'm going to keep walking in love. That's the fruit that he's waiting for. That's the fruit that he's looking for. And guess what? There is a tremendous blessing when we learn to do it Abiyah's way. You ever heard of land treasures up in heaven? Well, you do every time you do it his way. The next time somebody revile you for his name's sake, don't seek revenge. Simply lean into Yahweh, tell Yahweh to strengthen you and keep walking and let Yahweh deal with that person. And he will. But this is a blessing for doing it his way. He said, not only that you would help, it will help you to enter into the kingdom, but listen to this blessing. He said, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Somebody's lying on me. What am I supposed to do about that? Am I supposed to get upset about that? No. It's a lie. I'm going to submit myself under the will of Yah and let Yah deal with that lie, not me. Hallelujah. It says so, for my name's sake, look at verse 12. It says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Now, have anybody ever in here rejoiced when somebody reviled them falsely? You, I know you haven't. I haven't either. I haven't. Because it's hard to do when you're doing it on yourself. That's why I said the Messiah had to lean on Yah. That's what we need to do. Lean on Yah. And that makes it easier for you. But he said when you do this, you will be rejoiceful. Why? He said, for great is your reward in heaven. That's powerful. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. And I like this one right here, because this one here is very interesting to me. Anybody in here know about politics? You get in politics. You remember when Trump was in office? You had the left. Oh, they was reviling this man from up. Oh, everything he did, he couldn't do nothing right. He was all kind of names. And then here come Joe Biden. And we went crazy. And we're still going crazy. Huh? We're going crazy. You can go crazy all you want to, but don't you put your mouth on that man. 
You can go crazy all you want to, but do not put your mouth on that man. That's a law. I didn't know that until I started doing this study. So I had to shut up because I said a lot of bad things about this man. Am I the only one? And I learned this in this lesson, in this lesson. Go to Exodus chapter 22, verse 28. And he says, thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the rulers of thy people. Yah sets people in order. We are not supposed to revile any of them. Not our elders. Isn't that something? Our judges. We're not supposed to revile them. Our leaders, we're not supposed to revile them. It's against the law. And you know what? In the olden days, in first century time, people didn't want to be called a reviler. They didn't want that accusation placed on them. I'm going to show you what Paul fought vehemently. Have anybody in here ever been accused of being a reviler? But yet we are. That's the problem. See, we love to call out those ones like fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals. Oh, we'll call them out in a minute. But revilers, we give them a pass. We give them a pass. Listen here. You don't want to be called a reviler. Paul teaches us this in Acts 23. Listen to Acts chapter Acts 23, verses 2 through 5. I'm going to just read this. Please write it down. Acts 23, 2 through 5. Listen to this. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Now they wanted to punch Paul. They wanted to beat him up. Hmm? Paul was in a fight. They wanted to get him. Verse 3. Then Paul said unto him, Yah shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commendest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Now, Paul is defending himself, but there was somebody that stood near him and said this, and they that stood by said, Revilest? They called him a rabbi. He said, Revilest thou, Yah's high priest? Now, this brother to show you that he didn't want to be, he didn't want that label on him. Listen to what he said in verse 5. Paul said, I wish not, brother. What, it, wait, what is it? I wish not. He just like, I perceive not that he was a high priest. I didn't know, man. I'm sorry. I didn't know he was a high priest. He, he must have had on different clothes. But Paul did not want to be considered a revilist. Neither should you. He knows that that's going to keep you out of the kingdom. Then Paul said, I wish not, brethren, that he was a high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the rulers of thy people. It's a law. It's a law. Paul understood this. And perhaps you understand that now. Perhaps you'll change your attitude about talking down about your rulers, about talking down to anybody. We understand the power of words. Words come with spirits. And a reviling spirit would damage a person. All you have to do is have two daughters or two sons growing up in the same house. You revile one, you, you idiot, you idiot, you idiot, and you love on the other one. Oh, you're so precious, you're so precious, you're so sweet. And watch them grow up in 15 years and see what you created. By your own words. It's serious. Words comes with spirits. And if you are one that are casting evil spirits upon people to damage them as they're maturing, shame on you. 
Because the Father sees you. And you too might get that word, depart from me. I never knew you. I saw what you did to your youngins. I saw what you did to them. I saw how you reviled them. And then you want to blame him because he's in jail. You want to blame her because she's sleeping around. I know that we're all on this righteous road to the kingdom. That is our goal. We want to get there. We don't want to be stopped in midstream and says, get out of here. I know nobody in here wants that. Nobody in here wants that. But this is what we do want to hear in conclusion to this message. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Your Messiah says, then shall the king say on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's what we want to hear. We will do all we can to knock down every stumbling block that prevents us from getting into that kingdom. And we're going to start with not being a reviler. May Yahweh bless your understanding. And may he keep you all in Yahshua's most precious name. I had fun. Thank you. So many years, so many trials, God will be with us through the walls. He gives us strength through His power. Yahweh will never let us down, and we sing praise to Yahweh. Yahweh will guide us, praise to Yahweh. He will provide. you to guide my message, Father, and let it be pleasing your ears and edifying you this assembly. I ask us in your Son's name, Yeshua Messiah. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about from Egypt to Egypt to Canaan, kind of the Exodus all the way through to the uh, arrival in the land. And I'm going to hit on a couple different topics. Actually, this thing was, wasn't going to be this subject at all. It was going to be, I was going to compare Joshua, son of Nun, with Joshua, our Messiah. But uh, as I got through it, I decided I'm going to change this a little bit, so I thought I'd get more out of it. And we're getting close to Passover anyway, so I thought I'd try to focus on the on the Passover portion of it too. So I'd like to start out in uh, Exodus. Exodus, uh, actually, Exodus chapter 3. This has to do with when Moses, Moses met Yahweh of hosts. It says, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, And now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of Elohim, even to Horeb. 
And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. And Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see. Elohim called out unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. He said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, from the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Well, keep that in mind. That thought in mind, what just happened there. And we'll go to uh, Joshua chapter 5. And this happens in the land when they finally get to Canaan. They're, they're in the land. They've done their Passover in the land. And it says in chapter 5, verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes <clears throat> and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us? or for our adversaries. And he said, <clears throat> Nay, but as captain of the host of Yahweh am I now come. And Joshua fell on his feet, on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my sovereign to his servant? And the captain of Yahweh's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thy standest is holy. And Joshua did so. <clears throat> so, should be no doubt in your mind, unless you don't believe in pre-existence, that these were both the pre-existence Messiah, Yahweh of hosts. Because uh, an angel doesn't tell you to take your shoes off. So, he worshipped them. And angels, angels of, uh, I think it's happened in the past, and I don't know where scripture says where they, people tried to worship an angel and said, don't do that. I'm not Elohim. So, this is kind of what I want to start out with. Those are two they often happen on opposite sides of this journey, this 40-year journey. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of similarities on both sides on this Exodus business. Like you got the crossing of the Red Sea, you got the crossing of the Jordan, you got a Passover, the first Passover, and you've got the first Passover in Canaan. And you'll see, you'll see as I go through this uh, how they all kind of match up, and it's really amazing. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Joshua, though, how he got his start. And he's like the right-hand man of, of Moses. So if you go to Exodus uh, chapter 17, it talks a little bit about him there, about how he, he fought with the Amalekites. He was the general, basically. It says in uh, 17 verse 9, And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, choose Choose us out men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of Elohim in my hand. And Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. But when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up. His hands, one on one side, one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Write, for, write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nissi. For he said, Because Yah hath sworn that Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That happened until Saul's time. And then they destroyed him. So that was quite a long time. So that was Joshua's, kind of Joshua's start right there. And then he, he's, he's, uh, he's brought up again in um, 24 verse 13 of Exodus. It says in, in verse 13 of chapter 24, And Moses rose up, and his minister, Joshua. So he was his right-hand man there. This is where he goes up to uh, the mount. And I'm going to back up. I'm going to cover this little portion here, 24, 9 to 14. This is where they go up to, to see Elohim, the Elohim of Israel, Yahweh. And then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abahu and seventy of the elders of Israel. They saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of sapphire stone. 
Now as it were the body of heaven in his clearness, and upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand, but they sought Elohim and did eat and drink. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and the commandments which I have written. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us. Now he says, for us. So he's talking about him and Joshua. So Joshua didn't go all the way up, but he was kind of his rear guard. He didn't want anybody coming up there and nosing around. They'd get burnt to a crisp, probably. It was a private matter. So what's interesting here is, you know, these 70 elders, <laughs> they didn't make it to Canaan. But Rahab the harlot did. You think about that. They, all these, all the older generation, they didn't make it in the land. If you were, if you were of accountable age, twenty and older, you didn't make it in the land. None of them made it except for Joshua and Caleb. None of them, not these elders, but a harlot made it. And what's amazing, that harlot turned out to be Boaz's mother. A lot of people don't know that. It's in Matthew. She married Salmon. Let's see. Matthew, I think it's 1 5. It says in 1, in Matthew 1. Uh, okay, I'll just start out in verse 1 and go down to about 6. In the, the book of the generation of Yahshua Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac began Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, which Judah. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharez and Zerah of Tamar. Well, it says Tamar here, but it's actually Tamar. This is, I think, the Greek spelling. And Pharez begat Hesram, and Hesram begat Aram, and Aram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Nasan, and Nasan begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. It says Rahab, but it's Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. So David's, David is the seventh from Judas. But his father was Salmon who married Rahab the harlot. So it's interesting. And of course if you look at the Ruth, Ruth was an outsider also. So Ruth married Boaz. So that's an interesting take on Gentiles coming in. Okay, so I talked a little bit about Joshua's start. Now where he really shined is in number 13. And they're selecting, so they're selecting somebody from each tribe to scout out the land. To look her out there and, and check it out for 40 days. So it's in Numbers 13.8. Uh, well, I'll send out 13.2. Or 13.1. And Yahweh said unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. So I fast forward down to um, verse, verse 8 of 13. Of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea the son of Nun. Well, he was renamed in 1316. He's renamed uh, Joshua. He says, These are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy the land. And Moses called Oshea the son of Nun, Joshua. So you know the story there. The, the report came back. It didn't, they did not get a good report. Ten of them gave a bad report. And all ten of those died of a plague right in front of Yahweh. Right there. But Jacob and Caleb were the only two to make it out of that generation. So there he kind of stood out, you know. He made, a, he, made a, he made a name for himself. Not for his own. He, just did, he was just doing the right thing. So it talks about uh, later on in 1433, it says, And your children shall wander. Let's see, back up a little bit. 
Okay, I'll start at 1430. Doubtless you shall come into the land, concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. Said Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, but your little ones, which ye said shall be a prey, them I'll bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But for you, but as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even forty days, a day, each day for a year, ye shall bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, Yahweh, have said, I shall surely do it in all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. We'll fast forward down to 37 here. Even these men, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land, died by the plague before Yahweh. But Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, were of the men that went to search the land lived still. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. So they were, they knew they weren't going to make it. So they were probably kind of, kind of wonder all those years, their children are with them and say, don't do like mom and dad did. They're, they're going to be hearing this all this time. Forty years is a long time to be hearing that. So he probably had a mindset, we better not screw up. At least in my mind, you think they don't, well, they don't, want, they want, they don't want their children to perish in the wilderness. They want them to get there. So let's go to 27 verse 15 of Numbers. This is where Joshua's appointed successor, or eventually it will be. 27:15. And Moses spake unto Yahweh, saying, Let Yahweh, the Elohim of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, which may go in before them, which which may lead them out, which may bring them in, that the congregation of Yahweh be not as a sheep which hath no shepherd. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom this is a spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the, Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thy honor upon him, and all the con that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim. Before Yahweh, at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even the congregation. And Moses did as Yahweh commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge, as Yahweh commanded by the hand of Moses. So he's, he's appointed the successor right there, eventually anyway, when, he, when there, what's required. Okay, so there's something interesting here. If you're familiar with the, the Song of Moses, we talked about one of the songs, one of the songs this morning. If you're familiar with the first Song of Moses, which is in chapter 15 of Exodus, and it's in, it's in chapter 15, and it's, let's see, okay, about verse 1, and it goes all the way down to verse 19, so it's 19 verses. And it's pretty positive. It talks about this, it's a military success that happens. It's in the, it's in the, uh, it's in the, um, crossing the Red Sea. His, Egypt's army is destroyed. You know, one tenth of them, or before that happened, before they were destroyed, the army was afflicted greatly during the uh, during the plagues. Because remember, all the firstborn died. Out of that army, how many firstborn do you think there were? So you know, they already got their butts whipped. Then they all then they all died out there. So this was a huge thing for for Egypt after that happened. So there's this song is about the victory. Well, in Deuteronomy 32, there's another son of Moses. I didn't know this. Maybe I saw it before, but I'd forgotten about it. This is a warning, though. 
Let's back up a little bit, though, into 31, and it talks about why. Um, it says in verse 18 of chapter 31, And I will surely hide my face set in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they are turned unto other mighty ones. He's talking about Israel in their future. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Okay, the Song of Moses it starts in 32, from verse 1 all the way to verse 43. It's twice as long as the one in Exodus. Twice as long. And it's a warning. And I'm going to read a couple of these. In 32.15 it says, But Jeshurun, that's another name for Israel, But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. For he, then he forsook Eloha, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Now that's not good. That's definitely bad. In verse 20 it says, And he said, I will hob my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very forward generation, children in whom there is no faith. Not, not good. Verse 28, For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. So, those are doozies. I'll tell you what, that's a, that's a warning there. And he made them, it says, uh, it says in verse 44, after the song's over with, And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people. Him and, it says Hosea here, but that's the old name for Joshua. The son, Joshua the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel. And he said unto them, Set to your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do, all the words of this law. So, pretty interesting that I never really paid attention to that. I didn't, I, I didn't really know that there was a second son of Moses, so. Okay, then there's, I'm going to go into where they go into the land here. Talk about that a little bit, then I'm going to compare the events later on. The, the events of the Exodus with the events of entering into the land. They kind of mirror each other. I never noticed this until I started reading into it, and it's pretty interesting. Um, well, I'll go to Joshua chapter 1 first, and I'm going to do a comparison between uh, between uh, what Yahweh is, Yahweh of hosts is saying, and what Yahshua's message is in, 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 the, in the Gospels. Okay, so it says in chapter 1 of Joshua, in verse 1, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, it came to pass that Yahweh spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. It says in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Okay, fast forward to uh, verse 8. And this is, uh, I like to look at this and compare it to what Yahshua says in the Gospels. And this is Yahweh of hosts saying this. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and be of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For Yahweh thy Elohim is with thee, wherever, whithersoever thou goest. So you look at what what uh, Joshua says in the, in the Gospels. What's his most common saying? Repent. Repent from what? Repent, turn from your sin, and go back to following the law. He's saying right here. The book of the law shall not depart from out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night. So, okay, so they're crossing the Jordan. That happens in chapter 3 and 4 of, of Joshua. So, this is a pretty big event. In fact, it's so big 
uh, later on, the kings, the kings that are in uh, the land of Canaan, it scares them. Because they, apparently some people I witnessed it, and they saw the water stop in the Jordan when the people crossed. And they were, they said their hearts melted. I'm going to turn my notes right here. Okay, if you go to, uh, go to Joshua 5 verse 1, I'll fast forward there a little bit and we'll go back. In 5 verse 1, this is, they, they, these witnesses saw this and related to the kings. It says, 5 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that Yahweh had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their hearts melted. Neither was there any spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So, they were scared just by this crossing of the Jordan. They were frightened. So they had this event, the crossing of the crossing of the river in chapter three. I'll start out in three fourteen of Joshua. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests burying the Ark of the Covenant before the people, that as they bear the ark as they that bear the ark were come to Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped to the brim in the water, for Jordan overfloweth all the, his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far from the city, Adam, that is beside Zeratan. And those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed right over against Jericho. And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Now compare that event to the crossing of the Red Sea. They passed over on dry ground. And that happened after the Passover, the Passover. Then they passed over the Red Sea. And this event, it's reversed, mirror image. They passed over the Jordan, and then they had Passover. It's a different way of looking at it. But so after they passed over, they put memorial stones out in, the, uh, out in the middle of the river. It says, and it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that Yahweh spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. And command them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge this night. Okay, fast forward over to 4 verse 9. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. Okay. And drop down to verse 14. So all these 12, not 14, let's, let's go down to uh, 12. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spake unto them. And about 40,000 prepared for war passed over before Yahweh unto battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day Yahweh magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him as they feared Moses all the day of his life. So that's just a good military tactic right there. Before you go into the, before you take their two million people over across the Jordan, he sent like a security force out, basically in case the, prevent an ambush in case somebody's over there. It's just good sense. And Josh was in charge of this, and he's doing a pretty good job the way it looks. So. They talked about the kings. They saw what happened, and they, I guess they heard about what happened, and they're scared to death. Another key event that happens here is, is uh, Israel circumcised the men because for some reason they had, they, had a, they had Passovers. They celebrate Passover while they were journeying. It talks about it in, the, I think, in the Exodus chapter 9. They had a second Passover. It doesn't record anymore, but they... You can assume they had them, yet 
they did not circumcise their children in the desert. It doesn't make any sense, but it talks about this later. We'll, we'll go over it again. And uh, I think when they did the circumcision, I think the reason, obviously, is Yahweh did not want them celebrating the Passover in the land, in the new land, uncircumcised. It's, they were, it's a sanctification thing. So... Okay, so that I don't want to dwell on the circumcision too much, but talk about the reason for it. And it says in 5 8 in Joshua, and Yahweh said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Well, Gilgal is 1537, and it means and it means wheel. So you rolled away the reproach. Part of that was, I guess, the circumcision or whatever, and it just uh, and it was like a ceremonial or a sanctification thing. Well, there's a lot going on in this chapter 5. If you ever get a chance to go over it and, and, and concentrate on it, it really does kind of bring to the, bring the light a lot of things. When they crossed that Jordan, it was the 10th day of the first month of Abib. So tenth, the 10th tenth day is when Israel is supposed to pick out their lambs for Passover. So they were in the land, and they were able to do this because they had their flocks with them. So Yahweh's got pretty good timing right there. The whole thing, it's in verse 10, it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn of the self same day. Now here's another key thing here in verse 12. And the manna ceased. Forty years of manna it stopped. On the morrow after they had eaten the old corn of the land, neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. This brings up something interesting. This wire in Bible, I don't know if anybody else has got these notes in theirs, but... Uh, Let's see, I got the note right here. Leviticus, if you back up to Leviticus 25, verse 2, keep your finger where you're at. Back up to Leviticus 25, 2. I didn't plan to find this, I stumbled across it, and it's good to know because this is a sabbatical year. And some might not agree with it, but... I'm going to put it out here anyway. It says in 25 verse 1, And Yahweh spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say to them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto Yahweh. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. So, they were, they were in a sabbatical year, the year they came in the land. Because they, if they had started on year one, then they, 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 were, they were coming there, they were disadvantaged, they were moving in, and the land had already been planted. It already had crops on it. If you go back to where we were at in Joshua, they ate the old corn of the land, and it says, Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So it says in the note here, this is what their, their take is on it in the YRM Bible. It says, The Israelites could eat of the produce grown by others in their own fields on a sabbatical or jubilee. I'm sure everybody here is kind of wondering on a sabbatical year, what do you do? You're not supposed to raise food in your garden, and you're supposed to eat at your old store, and we're in this whole... Our whole society now is based off food that's refrigerated, foods that's stored. But it says right here, and as, as what the Israelites did there, they were eating food that had been grown by others on a sabbatical year. So I think it's good to know right there. So they had the first Passover of the land. That's Joshua 5, Joshua 6. Okay, but what I wanted to bring up, and I think this is pretty interesting, is uh, 
It's going to take maybe a little head scratching on this. So the Son of Moses, the first time, they say that after they passed the Red Sea, in the Red Sea they, pa they had to pass over in the land in Egypt, then they passed over the Red Sea, then they had the Son of Moses. Well, these events are kind of reversed in Canaan. They had the Son of Moses before they passed over the Jordan, this new Son of Moses. And then after they passed over the Jordan, then they had the Passover. It's kind of a, you know what, you know what book matching is on wood. If you, if you split a piece of wood and it, it, the grains mirror the other side. And it's different, when, like to say your hands, they match each other. When you open them up, you're looking at them, they look like they're opposites of each other. Well, that's kind of the way these events look. And there's actually, they're not perfectly matched, but there's about six or seven events on each side. So take for granted, take, take for instance, Yahweh met Moses on the mount before all these things happened in Egypt. Well, at the, at the latter event, after all these things happened, Joshua met Yahweh of hosts. Okay, the manna started and the manna ceased. They were not mirrored, mirrored exactly. But Egypt was afflicting the Israelites. What happens when, jo when Israel goes into the land? They're afflicting the Canaanites. They're opposites. Okay. Um, what's another one here? They spoiled the Egyptians. They spoiled them. And there was ten plagues over there. So you imagine what happened when they were going through this land. These wars took a while, but some of them happened pretty quickly. They were... They were taking things that belonged to them. They were either killing them or they were running away, and then they'd leave their houses and everything right there. Their houses, they were going to this land, their houses to be lived in already. Their vineyards were there. The fig trees were there. Their gardens were there. Their cattle might have even been there. And they, and they still had their loot from, from Egypt. They had, they, had pil they, had, they had looted the Egyptians. So it's an opposite thing, really. What, what happened to them in Egypt has happened to the other people in, in Canaan. In the fear. Remember the fear of Yahweh. These, these, uh, let's, let's go see what um, Rahab the Harlot says about this. Joshua 2, verse 9. I don't think I went over that. So she's hiding these spies. You're going back to all, backing up a little bit, but it says in 2, verse 1, And Joshua the son of Nun set out at Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into the harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Okay, fast forward down to where she's keeping them. She put them on the roof of the house in 2, verse 6. And she brought them, and she, but she had brought them up at the roof of the house and hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that Yahweh hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. But as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For Yahweh Elohim, he is the Elohim in heaven above and in, hell, in, in earth beneath. So, The Israelites would have considered previously, they would have considered uh, this person unclean. And she's got more faith than a lot of the Israelites. Right. You know, so that's a good example right there. You, you were talking earlier in your message, brother, about, uh, about uh, well, being faithful is a lot like that. You could be, like, lukewarm and like, well, I can, I can do these things, and I, eh, Yahweh's going to wink at them. Right. But if you've got 
great faith, and that makes all the difference in the world. Look, she made it in the land. And, and uh, she ended up being Boaz's, Boaz's mother, which that's the line of the Messiah's father came from, uh, Joseph. So that's about all I had. I hope, uh, hope you got something out of this. I did. I always learn something when I... I learned something from this one anyway. Open my eyes up. So may Yahweh bless you and have a good Sabbath. All right. Well, if you'll all rise, I'll offer a closing prayer, and then I'll read this ironic blessing. Father Yahweh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this uh, Sabbath gathering that you've called here. And I thank you for bringing us all safely here to this place and blessing us with uh, the bread and uh, the waters of life, Father Yahweh, you've given to us freely. And Father, we, we thank you for that, and we just ask that you would continue to watch over each one of these, our brothers and sisters, your children, that you've called out of the world and into this place and into this, this walk of faith. Father, bring us... Bring us all together again is our prayer. And uh, Father, I want to thank you also for the food that's been prepared and waiting for us down there in that other building. Father, we are blessed to uh, to have these things. And uh, so many people don't have, but you, uh, you have poured out your blessings upon us in abundance. Keep us safe, Father Yahweh. Put your hedge of protection around each one of us and uh, send us forth into a new week. All these things we ask in the name of Yahshua, our kinsman redeemer. Amen. Hallelujah. And from Numbers, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 22, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, Yivarekaka Yahweh. Vaishmarekha Yair Yahweh Panav Elecha Vihuneka Yeshe Yahweh Panav Elecha Vaishem Lecha Shalom Yahweh bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel.